Exodus 15, a little context here, very briefly, Exodus 12 and 13 describe the Passover and the initial departure of Israel out of Egypt. And then chapter 14 is the pursuit of Pharaoh and his hosts, and God leads Israel through the Red Sea. And we come to chapter 15, and there we have the song of Moses and the Israelites as they rejoice looking back at the Red Sea and the deliverance God gave them. They're now on the other side. And we'll pick up the reading at verse 18 toward the end of this song and read from Exodus 15, verse 18 through chapter 16, verse 3. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them, but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances, and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he proved them and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in His sight and wilt give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Thus far, we read the divinely inspired Scripture. The text for the sermon is verse 27 of Exodus 15. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. <clears throat> Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, after Israel came out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, they would journey in the wilderness for 40 years on their way to the Promised Land. And during those 40 years in the wilderness, was there any place at which they ever stopped that was as delightful as Elam? 
The Bible speaks of Elam only two times. The first is right here, sort of tucked away in the middle of the book of Exodus, the text. And then the other appearance of Elam is in Numbers 33, verse 9, where Moses is simply later recounting the wilderness journeys. Maybe you've never heard of Elam. Maybe you have, but have forgotten Elam. Well, you can be sure tonight that there were none of the Israelites who encamped at Elam who forgot Elam. Now, maybe during those long years in the wilderness, some of the Israelites forgot some of the places through which they journeyed or at which they stayed, but you can be sure that not one Israelite ever forgot Elam. Elam was this beautiful, delightful, charming desert oasis that consisted of 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. Now imagine this vast, barren, lifeless wilderness. As far as you can see, in every direction, wilderness. The desert. And now don't think of a floor of soft beach sand that you pick up and let the sand run through your fingers. But imagine a rugged gray floor of little pebbles and stones, gravel, and then big jagged boulders here and there, and off in the distance, mountain peaks rising, and these little colorless shrubs dotting the landscape, and an occasional lizard or buzzard scurrying through, and then all of this under the scorching rays of the sun. Barren. Dry. Nothing green. No water. And now picture some two million Israelites. And you think of that great mass of Israelites with all the older men and women and the middle-aged men and women and the younger people and the boys and girls and the little infants in arms and all their herds and their flocks, their animals, all these people, all these animals step by step walking through this barren wilderness. Three days earlier, they had come out of Egypt through the Red Sea. And now after three days in the wilderness, all their water supply, their food supply had been depleted. They had nothing. And imagine their excitement after three days when God led them to Mara. And there's water. Only to discover that it was bitter and it made their thirst even worse, at least until Moses threw a tree in the water and God made it sweet. But now imagine their arrival at Elam. Right after they leave Mara, they come to Elam. You imagine coming to Elam, the rest and the refreshment, the life, 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. Now when you think of a well tonight, don't think of a deep hole with a narrow shaft. The parallel passage in Numbers 33, verse 9, calls these fountains. These were bubbling, spring-fed pools of water, and they were all interconnected. And one biblical scholar and historian familiar with that area of the wilderness said, it's possible that these 12 pools of water all interconnected may have stretched out as far as even up to a mile. All this water and then a rim of lush green vegetation and then these majestic palm trees, 70 of them, rising into the sky so that from a great distance you see them and they shout to you, there's life here, there's water here, that's why we're here. And then you come and this beautiful charming desert oasis. Imagine all the Israelites coming here. They would camp there for nearly a month. We know they came out of Egypt on, according to their reckoning, month one, day 15, 
And we just read at the beginning of chapter 16 that they're going to leave Elam on month 2, day 15. About a month, and it, it took three or so days to get to Elam. So one month minus three days, just about a full month at Elam. And you, can you imagine how difficult it would have been to pack up the tents and to get every mo everyone moving again? Now we have to leave Elam. Where did they ever go in the wilderness that was as delightful as Elam? We cannot locate Elam today. There are biblical scholars and geologists who disagree on which of the oases, which oasis in the Sinai Peninsula would have been Elam. We don't know exactly where it would be. However, the name Elam does live on through history. There are various Christian institutions of mercy that take the name Elam. I was recently reading a book that was written by a man in our churches. It's a book of family history, going back into the Netherlands to the late 1500s. And in that book, he's telling about one of his female ancestors in the Netherlands in the late 1800s who was supporting Elam, located in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. It was a Christian institution of mercy that was set up to provide spiritual and material relief for Jewish refugees from Russia. They had an institution, they called it Elam. And you can find that name given to various institutions. And yet, every child of God has an Elam. Life is hard in the spiritual wilderness of suffering and toil and misery and death, but our life is not all misery. God always brings His people <clears throat> to the oasis of Elam so that we can camp along the refreshing waters. And He does that when He brings us here to His house. And we have the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we have opportunity, we celebrate the sacraments that Christ gave to the church. And when we come to Christ in the Gospel and in the sacraments, God brings us to our own Elam. And so tonight, let's consider Elam and God will lead us, cause us to lie down in green pastures, lead us beside the still waters and restore our souls. Exodus 15, verse 27. Let's consider it taking as our theme the delight of Elam. We'll look at three things. First, then... What was it like for the Israelites then? Second, now. What is it like for us now? And then third, later. What will it be like for all God's people later? Then, now, later. Elam was for Israel back then in the Old Testament delightful. And it was delightful in four ways. First, the delight of Elam was its rest. The main and important verb in the text is encamped. And they came to Elam where were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees and they encamped there by the waters. That is, the Israelites didn't come to Elam, stop, look, admire, and keep marching. They didn't come to Elam, stop, maybe for 15, 30 minutes, an hour, a lot of people, maybe an hour or two, get their feet wet, take a drink, everybody keep moving. They came to Elam and encamped. They pitched their tents. They stayed there and rested. This was their first rest since they came out of Egypt three days prior. And if you look out into the wilderness and the journeying they will take for the next 40 years, they will not have many places to rest. But Elam was rest. God doesn't always prove His people with hard trials. 
And God doesn't always send enemies to teach His people how to war. Sometimes God says, my people will have a time of rest. And that's what He said here. Israel, I'm going to bring you to Elam. And you're going to camp there and have rest. And it was so delightful. Second, the, del the delight of Elam was its water of life. The main feature at Elam was water. And so we read, they came to Elam where were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there. And now this description, not by or under the palms, but they encamped there by the waters. That's the main thing. Yes, there were 70 palm trees. They were beautiful. They were majestic. The significance of the 70 is not clear. It's interesting that there were 70 elders in Israel. And you start thinking, okay, maybe one palm tree for each elder and all that elder represented. But unlikely, probably 70 is just indicating a goodly number, not a cluster of one or two, three, four, five palm trees, but, a, but thick groves, 70 of them. And yet, however beautiful the palm trees were, they were not the main thing. Palm trees can provide some shade for some people, but not for all the people. And even if they had 700,000 palm trees, the palm trees don't give and sustain life for anyone. They didn't camp by the palms. The text says they encamped by the waters because everyone needs water. Water is invigorating. It's enlivening. It's refreshing. It's what caused the rim to be green. It's what caused the palm trees to grow. It's what every Israelite head for head and all of their animals needed. Water. And when they came to Elam, they had plenty of water. Now, isn't it striking that there was sufficient refreshment in the water of Elam? Because the text says, 12 wells of water, 12 pools, and there were 12 tribes. For every tribe, a pool. And therefore, no one had to squabble. And if you think about the history of these people, Going back in the lineage to the patriarchs, it was not uncommon that they would squabble and get into fights over water, especially in the days of the patriarch. And you think of the days of Isaac, and there was actually a well named Esek contention because the men of Isaac and the men of Gerar were constantly fighting over this well and the water. And people still do that today, of course. Water is a very valuable, precious commodity and resource. All through history, men and nations fight over water and water rights. Not at Elam. Twelve pools for twelve tribes. Everyone can get all the refreshing water they need. And refreshing it was because these were spring-fed Pools, as the book of Numbers says, fountains. This wasn't, <clears throat> this wasn't stagnant standing water, but refreshment bubbling forth. So how delightful to come to Elam and have the water that everyone needs to live. Third, The delight of Elam was that it was very sweet and pleasant to the experience. We have to read the text in light of its context, and the narrative is very definitely creating a sharp contrast between Mara and Elam. Verses 23 through 26 speaks of Mara, and when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. One word. To describe Mara, bitter. And then we come to verse 27, and they came to Elam. And there were 12 wells of water there and three score and ten palm trees. 
And they didn't leave. They encamped there because it was good water. By implication, not bitter here, but sweet and pleasant. The Israelites wouldn't have appreciated Elam as they did and the pleasantness of the experience had not God first brought them to Mara so that they could taste the bitter water. If God had led them directly to Elam and they had never known the bitterness of Mara, they would have expected it and taken it for granted. But God first brought them to Mara and then He brought them to Elam so that when they got there, they were all full of excitement and praise and gratitude. And you can even imagine some of the older ones rushing down into the water and calling out to the younger ones to come. You've got to see the water. You've got to touch it and feel it and and taste it. It's not like Mara. It's sweet. Come to the waters. And you can only imagine if there happened to be some man up on a a rocky cliff, maybe a quarter mile away, looking out over the desert, and here's this oasis, and all these Israelites there must have been loud. Every day, praise and shouting. You think of what they did after they came out of the Red Sea. Praise to God for His goodness and bringing them to all of the sweetness and pleasantness of Mara. How sweet the waters. And then fourth, and finally, Elam was so delightful because it was a token of God's grace and faithfulness. Our God is so gracious. They had left Egypt and they were only three days into the wilderness and they were already manifesting that spirit that would characterize them for 40 years, that spirit of rebellion and murmuring. And it happened immediately. If you go back to chapter 14, verses 11 and 12, they're being led out of Egypt. They turn behind and they see Pharaoh chasing them. And they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They're immediately chiding with their mediator and deliverer, Moses. God brings them to Mara, chapter 15, verse 24. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? God brings them to Elam. They leave Elam. Chapter 16, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. If you look at Elam contextually, before it, murmuring. After it, murmuring. And what does God do? He doesn't scorch them with fire for all their complaining. But He's a God of grace. He's long-suffering. He's compassionate in the coming Messiah. And so He brings them to Elam of all places because He's so gracious. And He's a faithful God. He made a promise to them, you are My people, you and your children, and I am your God, and I'll take you, and I'll bring you through this wilderness all the way to your final resting place which is Cain in a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. And I'll make sure that you make it all the way there. And so what does God do when they run out of the water? He brings them to Elam to give them refreshment because He made a promise to them. And He's faithful to His Word. Within three days, He's already showing His remarkable faithfulness, power, and keeping His covenant in keeping these people. A gracious, faithful God for Jesus' sake. Elam was a token of it. Elam, the delight of Elam then for Israel. Elam is delightful to us now, today. That literal desert oasis 
in the Sinai Peninsula was a picture of all of the delights that we have in Christ in His covenant as we journey through the wilderness of this world of sin and death. The essential and most prominent feature of Elam was definitely its water. There's no water in the wilderness, but there was water at Elam. And the New Testament makes plain that we have water, we have a well, we have a pool, we have a fountain, and it is Jesus Christ, our Savior. For example, think of the Samaritan woman who was standing by one of those old wells of Father Jacob, and Jesus said to her in John 4, verses 13 and 14, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. You put your bucket down this well, and you draw up water and drink it. If you go all the way back into the Old Testament to Elam, and you get down on your knees by the pool there, you drink that water, you will thirst again. But, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Elam of old is pointing to Christ and all of the delights that we have in Christ. So that all around us in this world as a wilderness is fiery trial and hardship and suffering and death and especially sin and the consequences of sin and guilt and shame and sorrow. But in the midst of all this wilderness, God gives us a charming oasis, an Elam, all of the delights that we have in Christ. So how is Christ delightful to us? Let's go back. Same four ways. First, Jesus is so delightful because in Him we have rest. In Jesus, in His once for all sacrifice on the cross, we have pardon with God. We have the forgiveness of sins. And with it, Rest. You know what's worse than walking? Even for 40 years with sandals on your feet? Walking through a waste howling wilderness under the scorching rays of the sun where there's no food and water? What's worse than that? One night. One night of tossing and turning on your bed? One sleepless night? where you can't sleep because you know what you did was wrong and your conscience won't let you sleep. It's plagued. Restless. The restless sinner. And what do we have in Jesus Christ? Every penitent believer has a covering. Forgiveness with God. A purging of the conscience in Jesus And that's rest. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we have victory over all of our enemies so that no matter who hates you and how they hate you, the devil himself, and no matter how great the sin within you may be as it rises up and prevails day by day, you don't have to be afraid of enemies and destruction because in Jesus Christ, we have victory over all of our enemies and therefore rest. And in Jesus Christ, we have a Lord's Day and God's wisdom once every seven days, every week. We come into this house of worship and this is an oasis. When we hear the wonderful Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we have opportunity to celebrate the sacraments, for example, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, this is an oasis for us. The Gospel of Christ We don't have to work today. And God says, don't. We don't have to take up all the the burdening cares and the affairs of Monday through Saturday. You don't have to check your work email on Sunday. In fact, don't. It's a day of rest. 
And God brings us into this house to embrace with a true and living faith the perfect rest we have in Jesus through all of His perfect works. Rest for the weary sinner. Life is not all hardship. It's not all toil and wearisome journeying. God gives rest in Christ who says, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest because I am your oasis, your Elam. I promise you, I'll give you rest, you weary sinner. Delightful because of rest. Second, Jesus is so delightful to us, our Elam, because He is the water of life. By His Holy Spirit, He pours that Holy Spirit into our hearts. And with that Holy Spirit comes all the satisfaction and the enjoyment and the spiritual pleasure and the refreshment of covenant salvation. In fact, even the the beginning of eternal life in the soul by the Holy Spirit. So that when the Spirit comes into your soul, and He keeps working in your soul through the Gospel, your soul is saturated. That's the believer's soul. It's saturated. It's dripping with the moisture of the satisfaction that we have in the knowledge of Christ. And you compare that with the soul of an unbeliever, which is all dried out and dead. Jesus. In Him we have the water of life. There's enough water for all God's people. Twelve wells for twelve tribes. And one Christ for a universal church gathered out of every nation, tribe, and tongue so that no congregation has to say, we don't want anybody else to know about Jesus. Mission work, we'll talk about it maybe, but we don't want to do mission work. And we don't want to go out and witness of the name of Jesus and His holy gospel, lest other people come to Christ and they're not, and there be not enough water of life for us. Let's guard it. Let's protect it so others don't take it, lest we run out. No. One Christ, a universal church. He's infinite. He's divine. He's the Son of God. And there's enough satisfaction in Jesus Christ for all His people. In fact, He is a well that is inexhaustible. Water for all God's people. Refreshing water. What would we do without the invigorating Spirit of Jesus Christ? It's hard even to imagine. If you're a believer, it's hard even to imagine what it would be like to live in unbelief with a dried out soul. Awful, awful experience. So delightful is Christ, the water of life. Third, Jesus is so delightful, our Elam, because in Him we have so many sweet and pleasant experiences. He's sweetness to the soul. We all have our maras. You know those really difficult trials in life that are bitter to the taste? And your own personal sin, especially, where sin promises so much, and it's so alluring to the flesh, but sin never delivers. Sin never gives what it promises. Sin will never satisfy you, no matter what kind of sin it is. In fact, sin always leaves you with a very, very bitter taste. Bitterness in your soul. Other people's sins leave a very, very bitter taste in our soul. We all have the Mara's of life, the bitter experiences. That's true for every believer. That's also true for every congregation. If a congregation exists long enough, has a stretched out timeline, it will very likely go through 
a period, a stretch, perhaps even lasting several years, where because of various sins and trials and disruptions of peace, the members of the congregation say, we have a very bitter taste in our mouth, in our soul. There are maras, stretches of bitterness for congregations, so that you can look back and say, oh yeah, those years, those were mara years. And you could really say the same thing about a denomination of churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at the timeline of a denomination as it stretches out over decades and even perhaps a hundred or more years, there'll be stretches on the timeline of the churches about which you will say, Mara, living during that period of time in so many ways left such a bitter, bitter taste in our souls. Mara. That's reality. God always brings His people, His churches, to Mara. But that makes Christ so sweet and pleasant to the soul and His Gospel and His sacraments. Even in the midst of the Maras, the bitterness, we're not alone and apart from Christ. It's right there in the middle of Mara that we really come to appreciate how wonderful the knowledge of Jesus Christ is and how precious He is to us above all things that could ever be offered in this world. But even then, life is not all Mara. Life is not all bitterness. Every child of God, every congregation, every denomination of Jesus Christ not only has Mara, Elam. When God brings us into a time of quietness and rest and refreshment and peace, the dominating experience is one of rest. And it's so sweet and so pleasant to the soul. How can you not lift up your voice and Sing to God for what He gives in Jesus Christ. If there were, as it were, someone up on a ledge looking down over the wilderness of this world and seeing the congregation in the midst of the wilderness, surely they could hear songs of triumph and joy and gratitude being lifted up to God. Thanks for Christ and the sweetness we have in Christ and saying to the children, boys and girls, we want you to know Christ and taste Him. We take you to church as we must. We see to it that you do your catechism. But we can't give you faith. And we can't believe for you. You must believe. All of us. And boys and girls. It's not enough just to come to church. Just to occupy space just to hear with the ears, embrace Jesus Christ with a true and living faith and taste Him and all of His delights and find Him to be the only thing in this whole world that truly satisfies. Because our God is sovereign, we pray and we pray and we pray to Him that He will make His call efficacious and take us and our children and draw us to Christ that we not only hear Him with our ears, but we, you, I, truly taste Him and find Him to be so sweet, our Elam in this wilderness. And then fourth and finally, Jesus is so delightful because He's the ultimate token. He's the revelation of God's grace and faithfulness. He is. He's so, so Gracious, our God. We don't talk about the Israelites and say how they murmured. They did. We have our own sins and our murmuring and our rebellion and our complaining and our complaining and our complaining and our complaining. We've all complained. Nothing's good enough. That's sin. And we don't deserve one glass of water. 
we certainly don't deserve a well of water, a pool. We don't deserve 12 wells of water. That's, that's only a picture. We don't deserve Jesus Christ, the blessed Son, and His lifelong agonizing suffering under God's wrath for all of our sin. We don't deserve the One who suffered that accursed death on the cross of everlasting bitterness for us because of sins He never committed, but because of all of our sins. But our God is so gracious to us. He does not reward us according to our iniquities, but He gives to us the fullness of Christ, our Elam, gracious God. And He's always a faithful God, binding Himself to us with an oath I am your God and the God of your children. I'll lead you by my counsel and bring you to the perfect resting place of Canaan that is above. And all along the way, He guides us and He brings us to an Elam. And He gives us refreshment in Christ so that we don't go through this life and this wearisome pilgrimage and then all of us pine away and die in our sins. Nobody's left forsaken and abandoned. Nobody. Nobody here is abandoned by God. He's a faithful God. And He keeps bringing us to Christ as He leads us all the way to Canaan above. He is faithful. Moses isn't the faithful one. Moses didn't build Elam. He didn't dig a well. He didn't create a pool. He didn't plant a palm tree. God made Elam and brought the people to Elam I don't provide Christ. You don't provide Christ. God has provided Christ. He is faithful all the way. Elam. Delightful. Isn't it delightful to have Christ? Now you're a fool. You're a very wicked fool. And so am I. If God brings us to Elam and we say, I'm not stopping here and you keep going into the wilderness, I'll find my own way. We're going to find you because we're coming and we're going to keep marching and we're going to find the buzzards picking your flesh because you're nothing but a skeleton. You're going to die. You are a very wicked fool if you come to church and you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you do not believe in Jesus. You do not drink the water of salvation, but you say, I don't need Jesus. In fact, I don't need to come to church. I'm going my own way. You are going to perish everlastingly in hell. God be thanked for Elam, for Christ, and for giving us the gift of faith so that we believe in Christ. And now weary sinner and traveler burdened by sin and guilt and your doubts and your fears, let your heart settle on Christ tonight and all of the delights that are in Christ. Think of who you are as a sinner. And then think of who Christ is and what He's done. And really let your heart settle on that cross in those last six hours, especially those three hours of darkness in which He was hanging on that cross. And no Elam. Not for Jesus. No Elam in the wilderness of that cross. Not even one second of an oasis. No reprieve. No refreshment. You know those soldiers, they had their concoction. They had it ready. They took their vinegar mingled with myrrh and it was a sedative to dull the pain. And they offered it to Jesus. No. Not even a little bit of reprieve. I will take all the unmitigated wrath of God, the fullness of the torments of hell on this cross, so that my people will never have even one little drop of God's wrath. He paid it all on that cross. Think of Him. 
Let your heart settle on Christ by a true and living faith and embrace Him, the beautiful Savior, Elam, oh, the delight of Elam. Then, for Israel, now, for us today, and briefly, in conclusion, later, for the Israelites, later was Canaan, and for all God's people, later is heaven. They had to do it. That's chapter 16. They had to do it. They had to pack up their tents, all their stuff and their animals, and they had to keep going, leaving Elam, because their true dwelling place was Canaan ahead, about which Deuteronomy 8, verse 7 says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. And they'd get there because God is faithful. But even earthly Canaan wasn't their final resting place. And so they had to keep looking for a better land. We have our Elam today. We come into God's house with the Gospel. And tomorrow's Monday. And all through the week, through Saturday. And then God brings us to another oasis next Sunday. Another Elam in the Gospel. And all along the way, we get an oasis and a foretaste of what is to come because we're looking for Canaan above. Heaven is our final resting place. Heaven is not Elam. Heaven is not an oasis. Heaven is not a place where you come and you camp for a month and now we all have to pack up and leave and go back into the wilderness. Heaven is not Elam. Heaven is Canaan. Ah, the promised land. The final resting place in all of its perfection. And what we have now in this oasis for just a little while, it's a foretaste of the unending rest and the peace and the sweetness, and the pleasantness that no tongue can tell that we will enjoy forever and ever when God finally brings us home to heaven. And now we have, every step of the way, His grace and faithfulness. So blessed be His name, the God of Elam, and the God who brings us to Elam and causes us to experience all the delights we have in Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for the sacred history of the Old Testament, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Who is a God like unto Thee? And Lord, thanks that Thou art our God also. Now go with us in this new week in the wilderness and keep us safe. For Jesus' sake, amen.